Hello. Hello, um, welcome everybody to the latest in our series of lunchtime seminars. Um, today we have Dr. Helen Whitehead um, from our very own Salford. Um, Helen obtained a BSc in Wildlife and Practical Conservation, followed by a PhD in Environmental Science, um, with a doctoral research focused on utilising eco-acoustic methods to examine bird biodiversity within the exclusion zone in Ukraine. She is now a lecturer in Environment and Sustainability within the Geography and Environmental Management Department at this university, with research interests encompassing biodiversity monitoring, ecoacoustics, and exploring the connection between agriculture and biodiversity. Helen is actively involved in outreach efforts for the Royal Society for Protection of Birds and has appeared on radio programmes to promote biodiversity conservation awareness. And will be talking to us today about her work on studying vocal activity of the common cuckoo in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Over to you, Thank you. I'm just quickly going to close my email so we don't keep getting that noise coming through. OK, so as well introduced, so I'm Helen. Um, I'm a lecturer here at Salford and I'm going to do a presentation based on one of my chapters from mm. my PhD, which is about the common cuckoo within the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Um, so if you do have any questions, obviously, please feel free to ask at the end of the presentation um, and I hope you enjoy it. So um, just to give a little bit of background, because I always think it's really nice to set the scene for the presentation. So for those of you who might not know, but some of you probably do, um, Chernobyl, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster happened in 1986. Um, but before that actually happened, um, it was actually a place where people used to live, where children went to school, um, and it was kind of an everyday living situation that, that we experience today. And that was 37 years ago, it'll be 38 years this April. And at the time it was part of the USSR, which obviously does not exist anymore. And this is just some of the pictures to show you what Chernobyl looked like, well Pripyat, which is the town where a lot of the people worked, what that actually looked like all those years ago. So some nice pictures there just to show you that. And just to set some context, so, before the nuclear disaster, as I say, it was kind of a normal living place, something that we experience now. People went to work, people had jobs, um, and it was found, Pripyat was named after the nearby river, and it was founded on the 4th of February 1970. It was designed to serve the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It's very similar here in the UK, we have a lot of factory towns where people live within certain proximities, and it served as a community for that particular power plant and it was proclaimed as a city in 1979 and had a population of just over 49,000. And we can see there on the map on the right hand side that Chernobyl actually sits quite north of Ukraine, very close to the Belarusian border, um, and obviously now is its own independent co country and not currently part of the USSR. So as I say, on the 26th of April 1986, which will be 38 year anniversary this year, at very early in the morning, at nearly half past one in the morning, reactor number four exploded as a result of a test at the power plant. And there was two huge explosions and we saw that the radiation that was released from Chernobyl was 400 times more radiation than was actually emitted from Hiroshima. So it was actually quite, quite a big event that occurred. And they tried for quite a long time to actually put the fires out. They used various different materials, but still it it continued to burn for 10 days. Um, and again, just to show on the map there, sorry, it's a little bit small. Um, it is very northern and that kind of red area is where that exclusion zone currently sits, um, just to give you a bit of context of, of where that is. In terms of radiation, I've seen this image a lot over my PhD time. Uh, we can see that where the red areas are, we see that kind of higher, higher amounts of radiation and we see where they're more blue, they're kind of lower amounts of radiation. You can see the black and white line that goes through the middle, that's the train line that is still active within Chernobyl. I heard the train many times on my recordings um, and we can see that there's that kind of western trace going towards um, the west. That is due to the wind that blew on the day of the event that happened and it blew the radiation trace towards the west, um, which is why we saw traces of radiation here in Europe. Um, so I know that in Cumbria, um, it was in a newspaper um, saying that the radiation traces had actually come over to the UK as well. So it actually impacted a lot of European countries in terms of how the radiation spread. 
So following the disaster, um, we've seen many programmes that explain Chernobyl. We've seen the Chernobyl series on HBO, uh, which actually wasn't that bad. We've seen numerous um, covers of it in terms of David Attenborough did an episode on it of kind of what it looks like now. And on the 27th of April, which was quite a while after the radiation emitted and the explosion happened, they then decided to evacuate the people from Pripyat. And they also evacuated on the 2nd of May, which again was quite some time after, they moved the people and some cattle as well, which created that area of a 30 kilometre exclusion zone. The image on the right shows us how we kind of view um, Chernobyl now. We've seen probably many images of this over, over the um, last few decades. We know that the area is pretty much uninhabited, but there are some small pockets of people who do live in the zone, uh, but the populations aren't, aren't very big. Um, there are still somewhat restrictions on the zone. Um, they, I don't know if they particularly like people living there, uh, but some people at the time didn't want to leave and kind of stayed where they were, um, which is, I know Mike in the audience has, see, has spoken to some of those residents whilst visiting over in Chernobyl. That's kind of the background of what Chernobyl is, just to give you some context. Um, but in terms of the species that I was particularly interested in in the zone was the common cuckoo. It's a really interesting bird. We've got the two images there. We've got the female at the top and we've got the male there at the bottom. So quite distinct in, in um, colours and different uh, plumage of how they look. It's a migratory a brood parasite, which means it lays its eggs in other birds' nests um, and it makes the other bird raise its young. So quite interesting, it'll go along to said species, it'll push its eggs out of the nest, the female will lay the egg in that nest and that other bird will raise its young and the female flies off and leaves that bird forever and another bird raises it. So that's, that's called a brood parasite and it is migratory as well, so it does come up from Africa. They do breed extensively in Europe, a few places in North Africa um, and they winter in Africa and Southern Asia. Um, I've never seen one in the UK. It's very disappointing, but I know they're quite common down in the south. So maybe I need to take a trip down there to hear them. So in Europe, we see them as a summer visitor. So they migrate up from Africa and their main breeding months are May and June. So that's when we hear the most vocalizations. That's when they're most active in terms of breeding. They're not really fussy of where they live either. So they like a lot of different habitats. So they like woodlands, they like forests, they like um, open woodland areas, scrub, heathland, meadows. And I think the pictures that I most common see of cuckoos in the UK, they're on kind of fence posts um, and the males just kind of perched on there vocalising. Um, so they're not really specific on where they want to inhabit. The diet, again, is quite varied. They are, um, they do eat insects. So they have caterpillars, crickets and dragonflies that they prefer to eat. And they're not social birds. So they only come together to breed. So at all other times of the year, they, they remain completely isolated from each other and they only communicate during the breeding season. And as I say, you've got the female at the top and the male there at the bottom. It's always very interesting when you see images of a, a poor warbler species that's about this size and a co common cuckoo baby that's about this size. And you can see this huge mouth that's bigger than this small bird and it has no idea it's not its young. It just continues to feed it. Um, there's some really interesting pictures of it that I've seen um, over the years. So it, it's always interesting to see. So their vocalizations are very distinct. So you probably all, I'm hoping, know what a cuckoo sounds like. It's a very distinct vocalization, um, hence why I chose them for this study, but we'll get to that. Um, they're not a songbird, so they're a non-passerine species, and they are basically named after the noise that they make, the vocalization they make. That's what the, what's what the species is named after. But it's only the male that emits the cuckoo call. The female does not emit that call. Um, it's standard throughout the Palearctic from Britain to Southern Asia and it doesn't vary much between individuals. It's, it's quite a standard call that they make. The female's a little bit different. So we can see at the top, we've got the male on the right there, where we've got that standard cuckoo call. The female emits more of a bubbling call, which we can see on the image on the top left, is a very, very quick vocalisation and it sounds very, very differently to the male. And we can see ever so slightly on the spectrogram on the top left that the male is also vocalising at the same time, which we can see in those lower frequency ranges there, and the female's vocalising at the same time. Um, 
<coughs> due to their really unique call, they're a real ideal species to study using acoustic monitoring because they're very distinct. You, you know when that species is present um, con compared to other songbirds where the vocalisations can overlap quite a lot. The common cuckoo sits at really low frequencies, so really easy to use things like automated detection and things like that for them. So just to give a little bit of context, I'm sure most of you in the room know what acoustic monitoring is, um, but for those who maybe don't, I just wanted to provide a little bit of information. So acoustic monitoring allows us to put recorders out in the field. Um, the only time we would really go out is to actually deploy them and maybe go back to change batteries, change SD cards, and then go back to collect them at the end. So it has that kind of non-invasive technique where we're not physically there doing a bird survey. Um, it allows us to record the natural environment, to record what's going on, and look at those different components of a, of a soundscape. So, you know, things like wind and rain, biophonic noise, such as birds and insects, and also some human noise as well. So in some of the recordings, I heard the train quite a lot going past. Um, we, we recorded passively, which meant we just left them out in the field continuously, and we just allowed the recordings to record passively. And we've seen over the years that there's quite different types of technology now. They were quite expensive um, a few years back. I know the recorders that, that were deployed in Chernobyl were one very heavy. I remember carrying one that Mike gave to me so I could take to a presentation, which I should have bought today. That's, that was a good idea. And it was, it was pretty heavy and I couldn't have imagined carrying 12 round in the zone, to be honest, they're, they're really bulky. But we seem to have moved on quite a lot from that. So the one on the bottom right is a song meter micro. So about this big and it, it weighs hardly anything. And now you can program them through your phone, which most people have a smartphone, whereas the song meter threes, you had to program it all on the actual device. It had big D cell batteries. Um, and it seems that technology has advanced a lot in this area. The one at the top is the audio moth, um, which took me a long time to get hold of one during COVID. They seem to be a real demand. Um, and they're around the 70 to 80 pound mark. Um, so again, another affordable way to record soundscapes going forward. Um, they're really good at studying species that are very elusive. So the common cuckoo is a very elusive species. If it sees a human present, it will just, just flee. It won't, it won't stay around. It doesn't like human presence at all. So acoustic monitoring was a perfect uh, monitoring technique for this species. And it's also good, in particular in Chernobyl, you don't want to be out there for a long period of time. Um, so you can leave them in certain areas um, to just record with no, no people interfering with it. And also good if it's kind of a challenging environment as well. You just go out, you deploy, you might go back to change batteries depending on how long you could, you're actually monitoring for. Um, and then you go back to pick up the device at the end. So they're really helpful in terms of those remote monitoring locations as well. So I thought I'd just give a bit of background, but I'm assuming quite a few people in the room know about acoustic monitoring. Um, but I just wanted to provide a bit of context. So just to kind of summarise what I've covered is after the Chernobyl disaster happened, it gave us a unique opportunity to be able to actually study the natural, almost like a natural laboratory to study the impacts of radiation on species within Chernobyl. So there's been a lot of, a lot of studies done on birds, insects, mammals, um, and birds have been subject to a lot of these studies in Chernobyl. Um, there's quite a few um, I remember reading for my PhD a lot, um, but only a few of these have actually looked at the common cuckoo. So the common cuckoo hasn't been well studied within, within the zone. But despite the limited research within Chernobyl, the species is actually pretty well studied outside of Chernobyl. So parts across um, Europe um, and Asia, we've seen a lot of studies on the common cuckoo, which primarily is acoustic communication related. Um, so there's a particular uh, researcher that uh, is in Croatia and he does a lot of research on um, the common cuckoo and that kind of acoustic communication between them. One of the studies, which is one of the reasons why I was interested in the common cuckoo, um, investigated different variable impacts on, on the common cuckoo. So they looked at things like habitat, soil type and also ionising radiation, which we know makes sense because it's Chernobyl. The study concluded that there was a reduced number of common cuckoo calls, in particular the male, they focused on the male common cuckoo calls, 
um, with higher radiation contamination. So I was really interested with this to see, you know, could we use a new technique that uses more technology to see whether this is the case? Because a study that was done uh, back in 2016 um, used kind of traditional going out, doing surveys, uh, making a note of the species that are present um, and also listening to that species. So it was interesting to see how a technological difference might have an impact. So hence why the common cuckoo became a species that I was interested in. There was a few objectives for the study that we were that I was interested in investigating. So we, I monitored the recorders were put out continuously, and I chose May 2015 being one of the most, um, being one of the most where they were most vocal uh, to investigate this particular species in the zone. And there were a few objectives that I wanted to to, to meet with that. So I think the first one, which um, was the most interesting, I think, because it was a new technique that I'd never used before, was using acoustic detec um, automated detection. So how effective can we use automated detection for this species? I was then interested as a result of the automated detection to determine how the vocal activity might have been impacted by total estimated absorbed dose rate to see if there is a relationship. There were other environmental variables that I looked at, including weather variables, so temperature, humidity, rainfall, to see if there was any impact. And also I was impacted in the kind of daily pattern, so the deal pattern of that species, to see, you know, are the particular times of the day when this species is most active. And this was an interesting one because a paper um, was written that studied this particular species and it was found that they vocalised throughout the night. So I was intrigued to see whether we saw something different from our, from our results. So that's what we set out to do, um, and it, it actually ended up being a really interesting study, um, and I learned a lot along the way. So as I mentioned, data collection, we use song meter threes, which are very big, bulky recorders, um, but recorded really well, and they were deployed across the Chernobyl exclusion zone, and we had 12 recording locations in total. So the map you can see on the right there, we can see we've got Pripyat, the Red Forest, um, which is considered the most contaminated place on Earth due to that Western trace of radiation that emitted during the disaster. And we've got the power station there. Here, we considered this low contamination. Up there was median contamination, and on the top right was high contamination due to the proximity to the um, nuclear power plant. And data used in this study were collected continuously, that should not say that, during May 2015. So I used a month's worth of data for this particular study. Um, and as I say, the data was recorded continuously. It wasn't at certain times of the day. So in terms of how I analyse the data, so I use Kaleidoscope Pro because I come from a very e ecological background. I don't come from an acoustics background. And Kaleidoscope Pro proved to be quite user friendly. Um, and there's lots of kind of support from, from their technical side um, and it, it didn't feel too overwhelming uh, when doing the kind of data analysis. So just to give some perspective, the song meter recorder has two microphones. It has one on either side of the recorder um, and recorded on two separate channels due to having two microphones. And they're marked as channel zero and channel one. I only used the left channel for the recording, so I used channel zero because I wanted to avoid any duplicate detections that may have been um, detected on both of the channels. And it's been used extensively, this method, in quite a few different papers, and there's a couple of examples there of why I chose to, to use that method. It's based on signal parameters, so it's based on measuring individual calls to get an idea of you know, what frequency that calls at, how long that, that particular vocalisation lasts for, um, and things like intersyllable gaps as well. So I measured 40 male common cuckoo calls. It's just the male in the study. The female isn't considered in the study at all. And I, I, I measured the signal parameters for that species to gain the minimum and maximum frequency, the minimum and maximum length, and the intersyllable gap. And I measured that for all 40 cuckoo calls um, to get an idea of what I needed to imp input into Kaleidoscope Pro for it to actually pull out the detections that I wanted it to. So I don't know how many people in the room have used Kaleidoscope Pro, I'm not sure. Um, for me it was really user friendly, I have looked at other methods I could have used and I thought Kaleidoscope Pro was the most user friendly for me. Um, so 
when Kaleidoscope Pro scans through all of these recordings, it's detecting sounds that sound similar <coughs> and it puts them into clusters. So most of the sounds in one cluster will be the same type of vocalization. And the first sounds in the clusters are the most representative of that particular sound. So the ones, let's say we've got a cluster of 40, the top ones within the, the first few within that cluster would be the most representative of the signal that it's trying to detect. So you see more clearer signals early on in the cluster. And as you get to the bottom, you do see a few false positives that start to sneak in. Um, so what I did, I went through each cluster and I labeled them either as cuckoo or other sounds. So I made it binary. It's either a cuckoo or it's not, it's something else. And it, depend, it was dependent on whether the common cuckoo call was found in the first 50 events of that cluster. And then it took me a very long time, but I went through every individual sound to determine whether it was a true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative. Because from that, I could then determine the, how well that actual automated detection had actually worked. It took a long time. And hearing cuckoo sounds over and over again, it became quite monotonous, to be honest. Um, but I wanted to really test how well it had worked. And I know that in a lot of studies, they kind of take a percentage of the amount of detections and they, they, they kind of measure it that way. But I wanted to do a really good in-depth analysis of how well the cluster analysis actually worked. Um, but yeah, it was worth doing when I look at the results that I got. It was worth sitting there for that length of time doing it. And it was actually, to a point, quite enjoyable. Yes. Yeah, so if I wouldn't have used the automated detection, I would probably have gone through and manually annotated every single call. Yeah, which we know has its advantages and has its disadvantages. They say humans are probably the best method, but the limitation is it would have taken me a very long time. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that's why I thought I'll go for something more automated and let's see how it actually works. But yeah. So the environmental variables that I measured were total estimated absorbed dose rate, so based on radiation within the zone, because I was really interested in that due to the previous paper that had been done, and different types of um, weather variables as well, so daily temperature, daily humidity, daily rainfall. So those were the environmental variables that I measured. Um, they were, in terms of the weather variables, they were taken from a local weather station, which now, after having discussions after my PhD, there are ways that maybe that could be slightly improved. So you could put an individual weather station at each of the recorders, which probably would have given us a better idea of what was going on weather wise. But at the time, I had to make use of the resources that I had uh, because the data was collected before I started my PhD. Um, so I made the best use of the resources that I had. But now thinking about it, if I was to repeat that, we would have had a weather station at each one so you kind of get them individual variables so the only issue with doing it with a weather station is you get the same temperature for each of the 12 sites you get the same rainfall which we know introduces some issues um but we worked with what we had and you know thinking going forward we it could obviously have been done a little bit differently but we worked with the data that i had at the time um yes okay so classifier performance so it actually performed um, pretty well, to be honest. Well, I think it did. I mean, you're, you're, you're the uh, acoustics people in the room. You could probably tell me whether it did or didn't. Um, so we found them at every recording location. They were found all across the zone, um, which again, wasn't hugely surprising. Um, they're quite well recorded in Chernobyl. Um, and the number of calls ranged from 2,163 to over 16,000 per recording location. So they're very, very vocal. Um, really nice species to study in the zone. So we had 128,527 events. That's how many I checked individually. So just to give you an idea of how much time went into doing it. And they are the amount of events that matched the signal parameters that I inputted into that classifier. So a total of 29,437, just under 23%, were classified as other sounds. So anything that isn't a cuckoo. And 99,090, were events that we that were classified as a cuckoo that it, it, it we I actually went through and checked and it was a cuckoo. The classifier really worked well. So where it said it was a cuckoo, it was correct 95.1% of the time. So actually did a really good job. 
and where it thought it was a cuckoo and it wasn't, so a false positive was only 3.3%. So the false positives, which I've seen in a lot of papers, seems to be quite a consistent um, reason why we get these false positives, is species that vocalise at very similar frequency ranges. Mm -hmm. So I can't resist not putting a bird picture on my presentation. So I've got tawny owls up at the top. They were really vocal in the zone. The collared dove, and I love the one at the bottom, which is the Eurasian hoopoe. Um, and it sounds so similar and its vocal structure on the spectrogram looks very, very similar to a cuckoo. So you can you can understand why it got a bit confused. Um, so that's where I saw these kind of false positive rates coming in into the results. Yes. It goes hoo hoo hoo. So you see, yeah, so very, and a very similar frequency. They're a really, really interesting bird. They have been sighted in the UK sometimes if they've come over um, and people take pictures of them in the garden. I've never been privileged with that, uh, but really the, the hair is so fun. Um, and in terms of what I was also interested in is I took a subset of the recordings and I went through manually and actually counted how many cuckoo call vocalizations I found as a human annotator and I then compared that to how many the automated detector detect picked up so the recall rate was 61 percent so um I annotated 8,363 calls which again took a long time from 108 recordings of a validation data set and the acoustic detector detected 5,058 so it was a little bit less than what I what I actually detected, but the, there are some reasons why that might have occurred. And also, the there was a variety of different recall rates depending on the recorder, and they ranged from 40 to 100%. So some detected really well, some detected not so well. And there are a few reasons why that could potentially um, have been the case. So in terms of environmental variables, so we didn't find any impact of estimated absorbed dose rate. We also have to remember there was only one dose rate per recorder. So we have to think that's only 12, um, 12, amount, 12 sample sizes of radiation. Um, and obviously the same with the environmental variables as well, such as weather. But we found that there was no impact in terms of the p-value. But we can see that with daily rainfall, there was a reduction with the number of vocalizations that I found, and the same with temperature as well. Um, so as the amount of rainfall went up, there were less detections of the common cuckoo. And that makes sense, because if, a, if an area is so loud with rainfall, the acoustic detector would have struggled to get through that, that environmental noise, which makes sense as to why there was a reduction in how many actually detected. So to kind of be apprehensive with that, it could be that rainfall isn't actually having an impact. It could be that the rainfall was that loud, the detector couldn't get through that rainfall. So it under detected due to those weather conditions. So the deal patterns, the kind of daily patterns that, I, that, that we um, observed, they vocalise through the whole 24 hour period, so all day, uh, which is interesting considering they are a diurnal bird, which means they should only vocalise during the day. And we had two really high peaks of vocal activity, which again make perfect sense when we think about the kind of vocalisations that birds make and the time of day. So between 4 and 8am, they were really vocal, like really, really in every location. And again, between 5 and 9, so we've got that dawn and dusk chorus. So we would expect to see higher levels during that. There are some kind of hypotheses of why the species might vocalise during the night. And that could be to, re to, to kind of deal with the acoustic co competition that's happening at those kind of peak periods during the daytime. So there's a lot more bird activity during the day than there are in the evening. But again, uh, that is just a hypothesis of, of why that might have occurred. Um, and again, I can't fully prove that with the results that I had, but it's something to to consider. So just to put into context um, kind of the, the study that I, that I carried out, so it did perform pretty well. I was really happy with how the study performed. Um, 
And again, there's another metric that I should have put on the other slide. The false negative rate was 0.5%. So again, it performed really well in all of the metrics. The recall rate, I was quite happy with. At first, I felt a bit disheartened. Uh, but when I actually looked at other studies that had done automated detection on bird species, it actually favoured a lot better. It, you know, some of these species, so we've got, I love the bird at the top, which is a little spotted kiwi. Um, we, oh, it's, it's a flightless bird, it's so cool. And we've got a pileated woodpecker on the right. There was some species done on, some studies done on those species and they, their recall was not very good at all. You know, some of them are like 30, 30 odd percent. So actually, when I actually compared my results to what had been done before, I actually had, the detector would actually work quite well. And so I was really pleased with that. And the recall rate for each recorder, as I mentioned a few slides ago, was a little bit different depending on the recording location. Um, so it varied quite a bit between recorders. And there's a few reasons why that might have occurred. So we know with acoustics, habitat has a massive impact on how that signal is is um i can't think of the word how that signal moves through an environment um and also one of the things i found was when the cuckoo was too far away from the recorder i could hear it but the acoustic detector couldn't so it, the automated detector could not pick that up and it's almost like the, the, the signal wasn't strong enough but i could hear it but it didn't get picked up through automated detection which again could be another limitation of this um, and again, as I mentioned in the second bullet point, we can think about the kind of absorption of the sound, the scattering of the song, the things like the call amplitude, how loud it is. Um, and also they do lose signal. They lose energy along a certain, um, I can't think of the word. They do lose that kind of um, energy of a signal over time, over an area. So links back to the first bullet point, if it's too far away from the recorder, it might have just lost too much energy that then it's not been detected automatically. Um, habitat and vegetation, there's been lots of studies that have looked at this and you know that does have a massive impact. A lot of the habitats in Chernobyl are quite are very, wood, very woodland areas and we know that those type of habitats do absorb the signal quite a lot compared to more of an open habitat. And Environmental noise seemed to have a really big influence. So if it was really windy, again, it really struggled. And if it was really rainy, again, it struggled. So there was a lot of signal masking um, happening in these recordings. It also struggled when there was a lot of insect noise, a lot of bird noise. And again, it's like the automated detector couldn't fight through all that noise happening at the same time. So uh, the ones that were like five in the morning and there was 20 odd species vocalizing it struggled a lot more than at quieter periods of the day where it actually performed really well um and again the the, the final bullet point again is a little bit repeated of the one before they may just not be loud enough for the classifier to actually pick it out of the recordings but i could hear it as a human annotator i could sit there and hear that species that species vocalizing but the detector didn't actually pick it up which is where we see that difference in recall rate so that's the end of my presentation because I was cautious of time and I usually like to waffle. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed listening and I welcome any questions. So this is a really good question. It was something that we considered during my PhD research is birds don't stay in one place, they move around. Um, and we looked at the kind of absorbed dose rates based on the measurements that were taken at each of those individual points. Um, and I guess we somewhat had to acknowledge that that was a limitation, um, but we made the best estimate we could based on what we had measured in the field. That's my best guess answer for that, but yeah, okay. I'm looking at Mike because Mike's smiling at me. Because <laughs> Mike was my PhD supervisor. So, yeah, I panic a bit with questions. <laughs> Yeah. 
according to the transition maps that the external exposure works at that way. And also, we can do a mapping of the shafts and see the utilized using the cabinet. So, we can get to a pretty good approximation given location of a generalized total absorbed dose for a particular type of burn. That was a much better explanation. Yes, thanks, Mike. Yep, any other questions? Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll ask one just to, because we've got a load of acousticians in there. Yeah. Um, you were saying that your ability to detect localizations of cookies was much better effectively mm -hmm. than the automated classifier yes. ability to do those detections. You said that the seemed to be the case that you were able to detect when the, the sound level associated mm -hmm. with that vocalization was significantly lower. Is there a way of, with, with some sort of basic-ish propagation estimates, being able to figure out what the effective sampling area is of an acoustic recorder when using a automated classifier versus human annotator listening to it. Based on those recordings that we've got, the knowledge of vocalisation of cuckoo. I'm not 100% sure, but I welcome if anybody does. I can just throw it out there as a question, because might have in the room that can Definitely. I think the unknowns you've got to face is, first of all, was your microphone calibrated on your Yes. Devices. So you've got, you know the level in absolute terms. Yeah. You'd have to assume the cuckoo is calling at a similar volume level, you would. Where, how far, far away it is. You'd probably have to assume it's calling in a similar direction because it's probably kind of quite directional, mm -hmm. depending which way it's facing. It could be quiet just because it's looking away from the microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got to worry about what's in the, in the way of the propagation. So you could be a, a day where they're calling where there's a temperature inversion that's traveling much further than not. Mm -hmm. So no doubt, I was looking at David, I thought David was He's doing a cracking job. <laughs> <doing a> cracking <laughs> job. No doubt, on some sort of average level, you probably could work something out. But on a particular call for a specific time, I think you'd be really struggling with the variability. That would be my take. Would you agree, David? I agree, and you can imagine acoustician's spending days playing with Python, sorting this one out, because there's going to be a point in which your criteria disappear into the background. And it's going to vary from day to day. And then you're going to be all interested into why does it vary day to day. And I think one of the main considerations is exactly what you were saying about the background sound. And acousticians in the room will be going, ah, but we've got two signals, so we'll possibly decorrelate some of that. So, you know, people could get a bit excited about it. Yeah. And it was one of those things where I, there's obviously two levels that this could be done at. One is the extremely detailed understanding for each of those individual calls, what was, you know, what is actually linked to all these unknown variables that we need to ultimately be accounted for. Um, but there's also this view of people are increasingly using acoustic monitoring techniques linking through to automated classifiers. And I just wondered if there was some more general guidance effectively that we could be developing, drawing on the kind of recordings and the analysis that Helen's done, which would give us a sense of what is the effective sampling range of a particular type of recorder for a particular type of species? It is amazing you should say that because Joel, who's sitting there, that's his final year project. I'm going to have a chat with him in a minute. But what I'm hoping he'll come up with is a list of these very things that you're mentioning. You know, in the past, I might have referred to an uncertainty budget and calculated it out that way. But you can see the idea of, if you say, well, what's the main thing going to be? Well, there's rain, there's wind, they're going to be on there. But minor things are going to be down the bottom, such as variability in the microphone from day to day. And once you've got that uncertainty budget, that estimate of, well, that's a big one. They're the things that we can work on, such as the effects of wind. As soon as you mentioned wind, Zach's nodding away here because we know when you go out and you're measuring outside, wind's a major consideration. Wind and rain, Talk to everybody in the room. If you're measuring in the rain, you shouldn't be doing. So don't do it under an umbrella, all right? Because you get the rain on the umbrella and the sound. Top tip that. You've got to all the students. It's amazing. I don't want to talk too much about this because Helen and I are going to chat later, and other people have got good questions. Yeah. 
the on automated acoustic detection thing how what how is that how does that work what is it doing so what it does is by inputting the signal parameters by measuring the calls it uses your signal parameters that you've inputted into it and it runs through all, that whole recording and it pulls out the, the call parameters that match that same one that you've put in. As in the ones that I inputted. Uh, minimum and maximum frequency. So how low or high the frequency is. So for cuckoos is very, very low. Um, how long the call lasts for. So an average based on the 40 calls that you input and also the intersyllable gap. So the cuckoo has two syllables. It has the cook and the coo and it's how long that intersyllable gap is for, um, which is why there was some crossover with the hoopoo based on the frequency and the intersyllable gap were very, very similar. Um, you input that into the software. You, you kind of direct it to your directory of, of um, recordings and it goes through each one and it matches what you've inputted to all the signals that it can detect. Um, but yeah, I did some extensive training with wildlife acoustics on that. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of studies that I've used Kaleidoscope Pro for these similar kinds of purposes, and they do seem to work quite well. Uh, but I would like to maybe advance to other types of methodologies because I know things like CNNs and things like that. But that is a it, being an ecology background. It's something that I'd like to learn a bit more about to see how you know, we have a lot of data, what else can we actually do with it in terms of a different type of method? Next question in the room? I don't want to. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about Dr. Denzel with you, but um, based on the methods that you use in the microscope, and I did see that you talked about the ivory mill with the woodpecker yeah. there, obviously they're cryptic species that are still not willing to confirm as extinct at the moment. Mm -hmm. Could you then hypothetically use that for, say, the pink-headed duck or the ivory bill woodpecker to see if you could not maybe necessarily confirm or deny, but as a tool to try and assist with confirming the presence of that species? Uh, OK, so using the kind of signal parameters for that individual species, running through lots of data and seeing whether it can pick out that species to see if there are vocalisations <coughs> for that particular one. Yes, yeah, so you can use it for that. I think one of the things to consider is Kaleidoscope is quite interesting. And I had this on a couple of occasions. So I looked at a full year of data for some for, for another chapter in my PhD um, to see whether we could look at when the species arrives and when the species leaves in terms of its migration. When there was months when there was no cuckoo detected or there was not enough detections that came through, it just didn't give you any results. And it would pop up and go, there's not enough for us to build a cluster because it's to do with how many vocalizations it can physically cluster. So I think the only issue would be with that species is it's not a very commonly vocalizing species. It would struggle to build a cluster on it. So, again, I think I've seen a lot of papers that have tried to look at these species that are maybe of conservation concern and they do tend to revert back to the traditional human annotator going through each one because it's really hard to build um, the cluster analysis based on a species that doesn't vocalise very often. Um, it was similar because I wanted to look at the golden oriole, which is a really interesting species. It's found rarely in the south of England, but was really popular in Chernobyl. But again, it was really hard to build that cluster for it. Um, and it was similar issues to that. It was like, I have not enough data to build something on it. Um, but yeah, I think maybe more of a traditional, maybe advanced method might be more suitable, but I don't think the cluster analysis would be best for that, in my opinion. It's it does make sense, though, it's just... No. And also, when you think about your training data, you could use Zeno, I think it's Zeno Canto. I always pronounce it like that. I could be wrong. You could take signal parameters from that database and input those. Um, but then we have to think about the training and the testing data that actually the background noise is very different. So I used data from Red Forest to test to train the data and then tested it on the other data set. So I read in some papers that if if you train it on different types of it, kind of environmental data, it can have an impact on the detectability. So yeah, it's it's an interesting question though, and quite a lot of people do 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 write about it in studies if they pick a particular species that's maybe of conservation concern and, and quite um, struggling in numbers, um, also difficult for species that don't vocalise very often as well. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Yes. So you're looking at radiation. 
the pink vocalisation. So how was, what's your mechanism by which vocal radiation changes vocalisation? So this is an interesting question. So the paper that was published in 2016 by another group of authors, um, they believed that with increasing radiation, there were less vocalizations and also their vocal structure changed. So I wanted to see whether that was similar, whether radiation would have an impact, but I did hypothesize that that would not be the case because I don't think personally that radiation would have an impact on vocal structure. So to give a bit of insight into my final PhD chapter, the paper in 2016 stated that as radiation increased, common cuckoos, males, had an aberrant call. So instead of producing two syllables, which was cuckoo, it was cuckoo. So they stated that due to increased radiation, that actually occurred. So again, that was my final chapter that I was interested in my PhD. And what I found was the male produced the three syllable call when a female was present. So instead of it being an, 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 a radiation response, it was a behavioral response to the female. And when the female bubbled, the male produced that three syllable call so quick. So it was more of a communication of that female being there. So it's a really exciting experiment that I did. And it, it was quite, it, I was really interested, um, but I, I found that radiation was irrelevant. It was more to do with a behavioral response. And then looking at the existing literature, the three syllable call is completely normal. Um, and there was a lot of studies done um, by a research group somewhere in Europe, I can't remember the exact place, and they found very similar results as well. Yes. I think just to follow up on that slightly, yeah. Trevor's question was specific about mechanism. Okay. There's two aspects to that. There's, yeah. there's, there's actually direct and indirect mm -hmm. impacts of radiation that could be manifesting. So there's the potential that in more radiation stress environments, there's actually a reduction in population numbers, and therefore there's a need for greater vocal activity to try and attract a, a, a maintain. There could also be indirect effects. So, for example, if radiation is changing vegetation structure subtly even within that area or changing mm -hmm. the, the range of, of, of prey species that are available, then again, that can change the way in which those birds behave and vocalise within those areas. So there's, there's always, whenever you're thinking about these gluten stresses, there's always a direct and an indirect aspect when you think about it from a wildlife perspective. But the cuckoo anatomy itself wouldn't be changed. No, no, no. So, so it's not about changing the cuckoo anatomy. I and mean, these things are, as you said, my phrase, you know, they're, they're flying in from somewhere else, they're flying out again. It's more a case of how is this affecting their, their density within this area. Yes. Yeah, can I ask another question? <laughs> um, <laughs> presumably, you pick the area for a specific reason, the Chernobyl area. Like, why, like, how does it compare, kind of? from a cuckoo's perspective to other areas, like, I don't know, just normal woodland or countryside or something? So I think the biggest difference between Chernobyl and kind of other areas, it's very undisturbed. So there's not a lot of human presence there. So it's quite a unique environment. I think the habitat in itself doesn't vary at all. To be honest, I think it's more of the environment is quieter. There's less disturbance. There's less human interaction there. But I think in terms of habitat structure, I don't think there would be much variability there. Um, the habitat within Chernobyl is like a mosaic. It's very, there's lots of different habitats across the zone. Um, but I don't think the variability of habitat would differ much from here and somewhere in the UK. But it's that kind of unique environment that there's nobody there, really. It, there's a few pockets of, of people, but it's largely uninhabited. Um, so it kind of gives us... It gave us a unique opportunity to look at those kind of radiation impacts um, without doing it in a lab setting. A couple of questions in the chat from Margaret and the first one has kind of been addressed in, in this question, which was um, what type of localization is easier to identify in your clusters? I think maybe you kind of answered that in terms of what that was the reason you chose the cookie. Yeah, yeah, this, that was chosen specifically, yeah. Correct. Um, and the second question is, what season of the year did the recordings, did you do the recordings? So the recorders recorded continuously, um, but for this particular study, we chose May 
as that's the most one of the most um uh, one of the months of the most breeding for that particular species. Um, so some months of the year there was none because of migratory, so they only come in at certain times of the year. But we chose May for this particular study in particular because it's the most common month of the year for that species in particular. Anyone in the room got any other questions? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know too much about like what it is, but pre-Chernobyl and post-Chernobyl was a large change in the predator composition of cockroaches, like right, the species composition. I'm not really with too many avian, avian predators and cuckoos, I'm not too sure. I mean, there's a good population of birds of prey, but whether they impact on cuckoos, I'm not 100% sure. But did you have a re was there a reasoning for that? Because I'm quite interested to hear. No, no. No, no it's, it's just quite interesting. Good. Yeah. <laughs> No, I didn't look at that aspect, but I know over the years there have been studies that have been done in Chernobyl and there's quite some really strong breeding populations of birds of prey. Um, but I'm not sure if those are any natural predators of the cuckoo. Yeah, Frank. Okay. So, like the pre post bit, pre accident, the Chernobyl exclusion zone had obviously the Chernobyl cricket at the turn of Chernobyl and also at 90 odd villages which were, were quite active villages and collective farms spread out across the area that is now the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. There was obviously at that time a routine of, of animals taking place as well, so, so large mammal populations are quite low, but as prey populations have been quite low. And then since the accident, since the abandonment of the area, we've seen those populations across all sorts of different organism groups increasing increasing over time so i think there's probably a very different predator prey dynamic mm. playing out now in the zone in comparison to prior to the accident but actually that wasn't really the focus and we don't have good data from prior to the accident to be able to do that type of comparison the focus was very much of we have what is a truly unique natural laboratory in which we can study radiation alongside other influences on particular species and, and that was really where that the kind of study focus was that Helen's view Yeah, I was just more think, I was just more thinking maybe in, if there was like a lack of predators for, compared pre post, whether that would impact as like a stressor on the vocalizations. I know lots of the stuff not relevant to the radiation and more just something I was thinking about, but it's interesting. We can chat about it. <laughs> Um, well, I think it's been a great discussion. I'd like to thank Carol again for the talk, um, and thank you everyone for coming. And uh, next week we have John Burton, who is a live former life science engineer for Prodigy, who's going to be talking about um, noise pollution and out from outdoor live music events. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me to end the meeting on here? Yeah.